going to go into the co-end calculus with open diagrams, I believe. So, so thank you very much. Um, and thank you again to the organizers for all the, the work here. Um, so this talk is going to be about how to reason about uh, some constructions uh, that appear in applied category theory, uh, both using co calculus and string diagrams. So let me first uh, introduce the preformal notion we are going to be trying to capture here. And this is the thing that we are going to be trying to take serious. This is the idea of incomplete string diagrams or diagrams with holes. So this will be this first part. And the idea is the following. So you already know about string diagrams and you already know about the process interpretation of monoidal categories. Uh, so this is when we interpret the objects uh, or wires here uh, to be systems, uh, but we also interpret the morphisms or the boxes here uh, to be processes that transform those systems. So what happens with, uh, when a morphism doesn't follow this, this standard shape for input and output? So what happens when we have a process that takes some input uh, then it will produce some output X. Um, only then, after having produced the first output, we'll take an input Y and then produce an output B. And the question is not only what are these things, uh, how to speak about them, uh, but also how should we, we be composing them? So we have uh, diagrams like these ones. It seems obvious, for example, that we should be able uh, to plug the alpha into the whole of the beta and we could uh, compose like this, this should give us a plain morphism in our category. Or for example, if we have U and V and S and T, even if they are the same diagrams, they can compose at least in two different ways. Uh, one, the U and V one, will give us again one of these diagrams. Uh, the S and T one uh, would give us a morphism on the base category again. So we actually find diagrams like this when we try to describe uh, systems, uh, either they appear implicitly or they appear explicitly. And an observation that uh, seems to work across all of these examples is to be considering that the thing that is inside these diagrams is tuples. But if we just take tuples, uh, then we would have a problem because this would be disconnected. There would be no connection information here. If we just say oh, this is a P1, a P2, uh, we would not know why, why these two should be connected. So instead, a solution is to consider uh, for every connection a quotient in relation. And the quotient in relation will be do as follow. So these diagrams should be equal uh, to these ones. And because we are identifying them, um, we are using a quotient in relation generated by these things uh, to keep track of the connectivity information of the diagram. So in other words, uh, we are considering tuple tuples uh, quotiented by the equivalence relation uh, generated by sliding uh, along the wires that are connected. So the next interesting, the next interesting observation here is that we can um, see that this is precisely um, the quotient in relation arising from the coverage conditions of a cohen. So we can rewrite this into a nice form. And this form is a cohen. So we can see, uh, for example, that processes with this shape uh, can be collected into a set. And that set is described by the Cohen I'm writing here. Uh, but also that the quotient in relation we wanted to impose on these diagrams is precisely the quotient in relation arising from a Cohen. So our goal today is to see how this works in general and to then use the, the graphical calculus to reason about these Cohen descriptions. So we have already uh, that this case is particularly well studied because this case is optics. Uh, but that happens to be really nice because now we have a case where the interpretation we know that works as it was intended. So before we start, um, let, me, let me give another advantage of this interpretation because this is one of the things that brought me into it. So is that now we are able to compute uh, explicit representations for this Cohen. So in many interesting cases, such as when we have a compact closed category or when we can Cartesian categories, uh, we can reduce diagrams like this uh, to simple descriptions in, using Cohen calculus and the general lemma. So for example, there is this observation in quantum causality that the diagram on the left should correspond to a four partite space if we are in a compact closed category. And that makes sense because this is just pulling the wires around. So you can justify this also with a Cohen doing the general reduction from the, this formula to this one. So, I'm, just, I'm using this to justify that this is the thing that we intuitively expect when we use diagrams like this. So what's the tool that we are going to be using? 
uh, tool we are going to be using is the is Profactors. Uh, more explicitly, uh, we are going to be using uh, the monoidal value category of Profactors and the graphical calculus as described by Bruce Bartlett. So the idea here is that we take uh, small categories to label the wires. So those are going to be the zero cells. Uh, we take profunctors between small categories with the one cells. And then we have that profunctors uh, composed by co-end in a way that this uh, resembles uh, the composition of relations, for example. And when we have uh, the monoidal product of functors, we can put the Cartesian product between them. Now, because this is a by category, we also need to take care of the two cells. And these two cells uh, will be natural transformations here. Uh, so we are going to be seeing this as deformations of the diagram. Uh, you could also see this as a surface diagram where the natural transformations are going on this, on this surface. So this is not as strict as we would want. Um, this presentation, at least you have uh, this interchange morphism. So you need to keep track of each time you interchange morphisms. You cannot make them into the equality as you do with my other categories. Uh, but after that, the things um, continue working. And now the thing I want you to pay attention is that we have two unit embeddings, uh, which are both monoidal set of functors. One is embedding every functor as the representable pro functor. The other one is embedding every functor as the co-representable pro functor. And these two, the, the images of two, these two unit embeddings will be adjoined, adjoined to the images of, of, the image of one unit embedding will be adjoined to the image of the other. And so for example, every time we have an object A, uh, we can consider the representable profunctor, we can consider the co-representable uh, profunctor, and each time they appear together, they can fuse together into a wire. This is precisely the composition along this A. And each time we have the empty diagram, we can create the identity on A. But the same works uh, in general for every functor. Uh, so imagine we take the monoidal product in a monoidal category. So I'm going to be drawing this with this uh, white dot. And the idea that that would be a pseudomonoid on the category of monoidal by category of categories. And here it will be a map pseudomonoid on the monoidal by category of the functors. So now again, each time we have these two monoidal products and they encounter each other, they come fuse into a wire. Each time we have two wires, uh, we can create these two monoidal products out of nothing. Another observation that I wanted to make here is that uh, diagrams without input and output wires are precisely set. So a profunctor from one to one is precisely a functor from one to set, so they are determining a set. And this is the observation we are going to use uh, to get the sets that correspond to the shapes. So how should we go about interpreting a shape on the monoidal category of profunctors? So when we draw a shape, uh, we can interpret it as follows. We take the inputs, to be representable functors, the outputs to be co-representable functors, and then we take the fork and the join and we map them to the monoidal structure of the category. So now we have this abstracted shape. And the benefit is that this abstracted shape can be now interpreted in an arbitrary pseudomonoid and a monoidal by category. But if we interpret it into profunctors, uh, we are going to be doing the following. So we first split it. We are going to be doing uh, tensoring first and then sequential composition. Um, so here I have numbered the variables, so you can follow which one corresponds to every profunctor. Sorry. Um, but the idea is that we can say what each one of these parts means, and then we can put all of them together and compose by co-end. This co-end will be uh, complicated. We have many variables in every point of composition. So it will give us a formula that is difficult to manage. Uh, the, the, the good news here is that um, you can now uh, simplify this formula a lot because we can use um, Joneda reductions as we were saying before. And when we use Joneda reductions, many of the terms just cancel out and we are left with the formula we wanted. So I think this is really nice because um, we are getting the formula of optics uh, from the drawing uh, describing the, the intuition on what optics should be. So when you start seeing optics, you can ask why, why this formula? Uh, with this Cohen. So we have this intuition of splitting and then merging back, and you can make that precisely here. Okay, uh, but there is a bit more that you may want to ask. And that bit more is, uh, how do you justify the diagrams we were drawing at the beginning, right? Because at the beginning we were uh, not only seeing the shapes, but we were al also seeing specific elements inside those shapes. And so the idea here, is to go to a slightly different monoidal by category. And this slightly different monoidal by category will be the monoidal by category of pointed profunctors. So now instead of just taking uh, small categories, we take small categories and then we pick 
some chosen object. So I'm drawing here uh, the profanctor on black, and then when I pick the chosen object, I put the wire on red. Now, profanctors need to be carrying a point. So each time we have a profanctor, it's not only going from small categories with a chosen object, but we need now to evaluate the profanctor on these chosen objects and then pick a point inside it. So in this case, for example, if we are picking F, uh, we can draw this in red inside the profanctor. And now natural transformations uh, need to do a bit more here. So they will need to be um, preserving the point. And we do that, so each time we do a deformation, if the point we want it to be the same, uh, the deformation will act into the points as we expect it to do. So now the thing we can do is not only um, calculate the shapes uh, of, the, of the sets, but we can also calculate elements inside these shapes. So we are going to follow the same procedure we were doing before, just first tensoring and then sequentially composing. So we split this into parts and is one of these parts is giving us a profanctor and the profanctor will have some chosen object. And inside this profanctor evaluated on the chosen object, we are picking a point. Um, so when we do all of this, uh, the thing we are going to get back is um, the same formula as before, but now we have uh, some point in which we are picking that formula. So now we do this and the, and the thing we need to do is to, to simplify again, as we were doing before with, uh, with cogenerator reductions. When we simplify with cogenerator reductions, uh, the thing we get back is also the element inside the, the shape we had before. Okay, so now we not only have shapes, but also we have the element inside the shapes. So the next step is to say, um, uh, how, wh where can we use this? This is the motivation. This is why I, I, I'm taking the time to present the, the monoidal category, monoidal by category of profunctors and the monoidal by category of pointed profunctors. And what is the motivation uh, on this? Some examples are the following. First, all the derivations uh, that we were doing before in terms of Cohen, uh, now we can do them in terms of diagrams. So the idea here is if you have your coins and you are using, for example, here the adjunction, you will be using something similar in diagrams. So for example, you're using here that the co-represented monoidal product will coincide with the represented diagonal. And once you do that, if you can duplicate, you can move along, which could be an application of Joneda, and you get back uh, the thing you wanted. So the same derivation before we were doing with coins, now we are doing in terms of diagrams. Um, so this is nice, first, because we can now do this in, in in arbitrary monoidal categories and arbitrary pseudo monoid. If we want to have the, this diagonal, maybe we need to ask a bit more structure. But then the second thing is that um, when we write Cohen derivations, the information of what the explicit isomorphism that's happening between um, Cohen's is usually not written. But if we write it, uh, the thing we are doing on the other side is uh, actually drawing the surface diagram and saying explicitly what are the natural transformations. So now you can use the surface diagrams to reason about this coin. So this is a, a nice thing for the application on optics, but this is just using profunctors. We can go a bit more if we use pointed profunctors because now we can say, well, each time we have a, a view and an update, I can follow the reasoning back. So imagine we have the V and the U, and I want to know what's the optic given this lens. Given this lens. So we can follow the reasoning back. We are going to be using the, the diagonal profunctor here and the co-unit, I think, of the adjunction will be giving us this common order. So it's nice because we can also reason about these things in terms of elements now. So now there is, um, this was also one of the motivations linked to this is that there is two ways of composing lenses in a category. And the second one um, will all, all only work if the category is uh, also symmetric or at least graded. So these two compositions we want to describe and we want to reason about them. We, can, we want to show that they are associative and immutable and so on. Uh, so here's the following. I'm going to put you here the two optics, the two lenses, uh, and we are going to be simplifying all of these two into a single one. So how do we do that? Well, we first put them together. And here you see that I'm using symmetry, not on the base category, but on the category of profunctors. Um, now we can compose on the x's, we can compose on the y's, and we get this back. Uh, now we are going to use the associativity of the pseudomonoid in both cases. And finally, um, here we could just simplify this because I told you at the beginning that when we have the, the co-representable monoidal product, the representable monoidal product, they just fuse together into a wire. 
But here we cannot. Here we need to use a bit more. We need to say basically that this harmonic is symmetric, that we have something here that let us uh, undo this twist. Once we do that, and this is why it requires symmetry, we can simplify that again. So not only we can reason about this in this uh, sense, but we can also use the diagrams directly. So now we have uh, some specific optics and we want to compose them in the two ways. So let's do that. We follow again the composition, moving parts around. Uh, then we are going to be composing associativity. We apply the symmetry and then we reduce the two monoidal products again. So the thing we get back after all this process is exactly what are the images of the composition of two optics under these two composition. So this thing is nice um, when we want to reason about how these, these optics are, this composition of optics from categories, but they are associative and also unital. Um, so another, another use case is when you have something on the literature that you want to, 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 to explain in, in some terms in these diagrams. Uh, so for example, we know that lenses should be related to dynamical systems, at least to discrete dynamical system in some form. Um, so the idea here is the following one. If we pick the, the right-hand side of, of the optic, and they now use the, the, the bi monoidal bicategory of profunctors, this compact cloth, as by a paper on IT today, I think. Um, so now we can move part of the optic to the other side and compose there. So you can do this, and then this looks like feedback so my surprise was to see that this thing is precisely a morphism on the free category with feedback in the sense of Cathy, Sabrina, and Walters. So that now means that each time you have the lens, you can project uh, to any category with feedback because this would be the, the amorphism on the free category with feedback. Um, so I think this is not as, as deep conceptually because now you are like literally drawing the feedback here. Okay. So on the paper, I think I don't have much more time. So in the paper, you will find uh, other examples on how you reason with these coins and these things, and how you get uh, concrete representations with the categories Cartesian. Um, I think there are also mm, many other examples. Uh, also on optics, if you, if you were following the previous session, uh, we'll have examples on mixed optics and all those kind of things, now done with the, the, the graphical calculus. I'm putting some of the references. I could not copy all of them, but there are many. And, uh, and I think that's all. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Mario. Uh, do we have questions for Mario? Uh, yes, can I ask a question? Go ahead. Um, so, so my question is about the um, the equivalence you consider, so, so when you treat this, this certain kind of co-end uh, as a comb, um, so, so the quotient that the co-end takes is this idea that, that you know, I can factorize this kind of extra map either into F or into G, right? And that's how I make um, equivalence classes. Okay. Um, another natural, what I would say is probably the more natural condition is a kind of contextual equivalence which is for any H I plug in in between F and G, possibly that has some auxiliary wires, yeah. uh, that the resulting morphism is the same. Yeah. Uh, is this the same or do you need to kind of require this uh, of your category or, or, or what? Yeah, so that, that's a question that I, I tried to answer, but I haven't yet. So that's, that's, yeah, that's a really good question. And it's something that I was thinking too. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know right now, I could not answer at all. Okay. Um, so I don't know if that implies contextual equivalence in, in any case. So this would be like if we uh, interpret any morphism. Um, so if we put anything on the on the whole of that of that comb. Uh, it should be the same. If two are equal, if you only if the, it's exactly the same if you put some morphism there, right? Yeah. So this question has been also addressed on optics. So in general, I don't know on optics. I think um, I think John Boisseau has something on this, but I don't know in general. I mean, in general, it would be really nice to. Mm -hmm. to try to do it to address. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I guess for compact, it's true, right? Because of, yeah. that, because of that statement you said about yeah. how this co-end yeah. is equivalent to the compact closed thing. Yeah, that's true. So for, for compact close, um, we don't have any problem with these things because it's pulling the wires around. It makes a lot of sense. The problem is we don't have that much structure and you want to do something else. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Any more questions?
Okay, so um, so let's, uh, if there's no more questions, let's thank Mario again. And um, we have...